tonight, it's my honor to introduce the 10th annual Robert C. Barron Lecture here at the AAS. The lecture is named for uh, Bob Barron, who served as the chairman of the AAS Council from 1993 to 2003. Bob's a man of many talents. He designed computers for the space program, he co-founded his own computer company, and then, uh, in witness uh, the true breadth of his interests, he started a publishing company. Uh, Bob and his wife Charlotte uh, have long been generous friends of AAS, where they've endowed two fellowships for creative and performing artists. Uh, upon Bob's retirement from the chairmanship of the council, uh, a group of his friends decided that a lecture given annually by a distinguished member of the society would be an excellent way to honor Bob's service and to recognize his intellectual curiosity. The premise of the Baron Lecture is to ask a writer of a particularly significant work <coughs> of history to deliver a retrospective lecture looking back on the book uh, and reflecting on the goals and purposes of the book at the time of writing, as well as thinking about how that work is held up and what it has to say today. Which brings us to tonight's business. Uh, Richard Lyman Bushman is the Governor Morris Professor of History Emeritus at Columbia University. Professor Bushman received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from Harvard University, uh, earning a PhD in History of American Civilization. He has taught at Harvard, Brigham Young University, uh, Boston University, the University of Delaware, and served as a Howard W. Hunter Visiting Professor in Mormon Studies at the Claremont Graduate University. Uh, Professor Bushman has left a significant mark on two fields, early American history and Mormon history. Uh, his first book, From Puritan to Yankee, Character and Social Order in Connecticut, 1690 to 1765, uh, published in 1968, won the Bancroft Prize. Um, in 2006, Professor Bushman received the Mormon History Association's annual 2006 Best Book Award for his biography of Joseph Smith, uh, Rough Stone Rolling. He's held Guggenheim, Huntington, National Humanities Center, and National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships, and served as president of the Mormon History Association from 1985 to 1986. Uh, and his most recent and perhaps most unusual honor, uh, a chair, an endowed chair of Mormon Studies, named the Richard Bushman Chair of Mormon Studies, recently created at the University of Virginia, uh, a school with which Professor Bushman, Bushman had previously had no official connection. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it is the only chair in Mormon Studies at a public university in the United States. Uh, tonight, Professor Bushman will be speaking about his 1992 book, The Refinement of America, Persons, Houses, Cities, a uh, book that the flyer about our public programs claims uh, seemed to explain everything, including the author's relationship with his mother, um, which is somewhat beyond the usual scope of the Bering Lecture. Uh, this book explores the dyna dynamics and spread of aristocratic gentility in otherwise Republican America from the beginning of the 18th century to the onset of the Civil War. The spread of these ideas of gentility, <coughs> Professor Bushman argued, contributed to American sense of their society as a classless one. Classes as having no class, but having no classes. Um, uh, and it helped to prop up notions of republicanism and market capitalism, turning producers into consumers of goods that would mark them as respectable. Uh, this book was a landmark in the turn towards incorporating material culture and architecture uh, into, the, into larger histories of early America, and perhaps more importantly, for people who received their graduate training in early American studies in the 1990s, as I did. Uh, the argument advanced in the book was something that one needed to have an opinion about, uh, to the extent that it was simply invoked as the Bushman hypothesis in seminar rooms, which is an honor that's usually only accorded to physicists, I think, uh, to have a hypothesis named after them. Um, in the spirit of optimism, at least I hope so, Professor Bushman has titled his lecture this evening, The Refinement of America. Is there hope? Uh, there's a question mark up there. Uh, please join me in welcoming Richard Bushman and Brian. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you all for coming to this lustrous place. It's such a happy home. As, uh, there are many reasons for me to feel satisfied being here, just coming into this hall is always elevating. You know, a scholar's map of the world uh, features the places where it feels most at home, and my personal map, where I work most profitably, would include the Huntington Museum and Library, New York Historical Society, the Massachusetts Historical Society, the British Library, and it's one of the brightest spots on this map, the American Antiquary Society. I uh, actually feel personally indebted to the founders of this institution, to the collectors, to the curators and the librarians, and not least to the donors and government boards. It's uh, self-evident, I believe, that scholarship depends upon this collaboration of learning, philanthropy, and patronship, and uh, that partnership can never be taken for granted. Uh, 
I know very well that many people work very hard for institutions of learning like this one to flourish, and I really welcome the opportunity to express my appreciation. <clears throat> it's good to see friends here, Alden and Ginger Vaughn, and, and Richard and Irene Brown and others. I'm sorry David Hall couldn't be here, and the person who's associated with this institution. David's uh, lecturing in Japan uh, this week, but uh, I will um, pay one homage to him. Uh, we worked together at Boston University, and it was David's habit of always looking for a funny story to open his comments when he's, he speaks. So in his honor, I want to offer a story that I picked up on the West Coast while I was working at the Huntington. And the story goes back some years when Asian students were just beginning to filter across the Pacific to the West Coast universities in the United States. And this uh, young Chinese student arrived at Berkeley and was being uh, um, prepared to begin his studies and going from meeting to meeting. He met his advisor and the advisor uh, said to him, well now, your next point on your schedule is the orientation meeting. And the Chinese person looked very puzzled and said, Orient orientation meeting? He said, I didn't come here to be oriented, I came here to be oxidized. <laughs> So there's always a story behind the writing of a book, and what Paul asked me to do is to reflect on this book, The Refinement of America. I stumbled onto the topic because of a change of jobs. In 1977, Claudia and I and our six children moved from Boston to Newark, Delaware. It's not Newark, it's Newark. Delaware, where I had accepted a position as chair of the history department at the University of Delaware. I think uh, Delaware took an interest in me because I worked in developing a program at Boston University that involved museums. We had linked uh, BU's American and New England Studies program to Old Sturbridge Village, the Museum of Fine Arts, the Society for the Preservation of New England uh, antiquities, and of course, the American Antiquarian Society. That was a good preparation for Delaware because the university there had established a close relationship with two nearby museums. Hagley, a museum built around the old pond powder mills that uh, focused on the history of technology, <clears throat> and Winter Tour, with its massive decorative arts collections. I think the Delaware History Department wanted someone who was sympathetic to material culture studies, and I filled the bill because of my background in New England at, at BU. Collaborating with these two museums, I became more interested than ever in material culture. There was so much to work with at Winterthur. Henry Francis DuPont, um, as many of you know, was the sort of the mastermind behind the Miniature Museum. He was an eccentric, energetic genius who enjoyed the fruits of the DuPont family's various student investments in chemicals and automobiles. DuPont Chemical and General Motors was the source of Henry Francis's uh, fortune. With this wealth, Henry Francis assembled a vast collection of rooms from 18th century houses, furnished them with period pieces, and installed them in a huge extension of the DuPont family mansion named Winter Tour. The Winter Tour MA program in early American culture, as it was called then, <clears throat> was the premier training ground for curators and decorative art specialists across the country. Jumping on the Winter Tour bandwagon, I helped organize a PhD program in American Civilization at Delaware with an emphasis on material culture. 
I thought Winotour and Hadley were the department's greatest resources and wanted to make the most of them. Involved as I was, the moment inevitably came when I had to lead a seminar for Winotour students and try to figure out what the vast DuPont collection added up to. I'd always known the colonial world was populated by silver teapots, black walnut tables, carpets, and Queen Anne chairs, but not until I saw them laid out in the 175 rooms of the Winter Tour Museum did I experience the full impact of their presence in the colonial past. These were costly items, items requiring <clears throat> immense skill to produce and obviously highly cherished by those who purchased them. And that raised questions. What motivated the purchase and care of all this stuff? <clears throat> These objects had no immediate economic use. If anything, they deflected business away from lands and cargoes into useless and beautiful things. Why this diversion away from economic rationality to vain display. The reigning sociological explanation at the time was status. People bought furnishings for their parlors and bedrooms to claim a place in the social hierarchy. But that word, status, seemed inadequate to me. Was it just the pecking order people were concerned about? If so, why this particular kind of goods? Why not body tattoos? or total pulls. <clears throat> as I begin to investigate the materials of early America as found in Winotour and similar museums up and down the coast, Deerfield certainly a good example, <clears throat> an important fact dawned on me. The nature of colonial housing changed radically after 1700. In the 17th century, even wealthy men had lived in simple houses. The great mansions that we associate with the colonial elites were almost entirely constructed in the 18th century, most of them after 1720. From the first settlement until 1700 or so, planters and merchants dwelt in unpainted, framed houses with small windows, minimal decoration, and simple two and three room floor plans. In New England in 1700, this top of the line house built in the prospering town of Weather Weathersfield on the Connecticut River was an unpainted frame structure with small windows and simple doors and window frames. The furnishings were correspondingly simple. A small number of pieces framed by simple methods and lacking the smooth sheen of later cabinet work. These houses contained less porcelain, less fabric, and many fewer portraits. This plain living was a sensible style for improving farmers and merchants who had nothing to gain financially and much to lose by expending their wealth on useless display. Why the change after 1700? After 1720 particularly, the colonial gentry, gentry departed from the frugality that economic rationality dictated. The governor's palace in Williamsburg completed in 1712 a grand mansion built on an English model was the most dramatic departure. In its wake, partly inspired by its example, mansions appeared throughout the Chesapeake along the James River, in Annapolis, everywhere through the tidewater, but not only here, within the range of the palace's influence. Similar mansions were built up and down the coast from New Hampshire to Georgia, in cities and in the countryside. The gentry everywhere <coughs> built mansions as if their persons were not complete, with great houses filled with beautiful and expensive objects, many of you will recognize. Brown Street House for Longfellow, called the Longfellow House. We think of that, of course, they built larger houses because their wealth had increased. Their frugality had paid off. 
and now they were enjoying the fruits of their labor. Doubtless, increased wealth did make the purchases possible, but that does not explain what they hope to derive from their display of beauty and why they willingly invested so much. What, for example, would lead William Corbett to construct his house in the little village of Camp Mills Bridge, Delaware, in 1772 to 1774? Corbett, a tanner and merchant, erected a three-story brick house on the bluff overlooking the creek that led from the village to Delaware Bay. The cost of the cellar and the brick exterior, the basic framework of the house, came to 78 pounds. Under the overhang of the roof and throughout the house were 930 feet of cornice. The cornice cost 102 pounds, nearly a third more than the bricks. The cellar and the bricks were essential to the construction of the house. The cornice was purely decorative, with no functional value. Corbett paid more for this single luxury than for the basic house itself, not to mention scores of other decorative details inside and out. How could such an expenditure be justified in terms of rational economic behavior? Well, besides this surge of elegant housing after 1720, a second clue to the meaning of the material came from the writing exercise of George Washington. This is in his own hand, and you probably could barely read it. What it says at the top is rules of civility. Partly to improve his handwriting and partly to improve his manners, Washington's tutor sent him to copy what was called Rules of Civility. It consisted of 110 rules for personal conduct, including such helpful hints, take notes at this point, keep your nails clean and short, also your hands and teeth clean, yet without showing any great concern for them. And here's another. In the presence of others, Sing not to yourself with a humming noise, nor drum with your fingers or feet. And do not laugh too loud or too much at any public spectacle. These rules were interesting as an effort to show proper conduct through a long, long list of detailed admonitions. But what intrigued me equally was their origin. Washington took his rules from a century-old manual written by Francis Hawkins in England in 1640 and called Youth's Behavior or Decency in Conversation Among Men. And Hawkins' book was actually a translation of a 1595 French book by Jesuit schoolmasters who took most of their rules from a still earlier book by Giovanni della Casa called Il Galateo, and first published in 1558. In other words, Washington's rules were nearly 200 years old when he made his copy. Furthermore, the French and Italian books were written by a young gentleman preparing for life at court. The tutors and schoolmasters were trying to teach them how to behave in the finest European society. And here, George Washington, living on the margins of the civilized world in the 18th century America, was being taught to behave like elite European youth two centuries earlier. Piqued by this peculiar conjunction, a surge in elegant housing after 1700, and the adoption of European court etiquette books on the American frontier, I eventually pieced together the story of an entire culture of which the rule books were a part. That culture was summed up like, in words like gentility, refinement, polished, and polite. I learned that rules Washington copied actually went back much further than 200 years. They grew out of a classical tradition of urbanity, 
explicated by writers such as Horace, Ovid, and Cicero. They contrasted the polished life of city people with the rough vulgarity of rustics and promoted urbanity as the highest form of living. Through the Middle Ages, this tradition survived in diminished form in European courts and then was revived along with all of classical civilization in the Renaissance. In the 15th century, Italian writers like Galateo and Castiglione produced manuals on civility that were copied and imitated for the next 300 years. Literally hundreds of these manuals, probably thousands of them, or courtesy books they were called, based on the word court, mode of behavior in the royal court, were produced in early European uh, society. Lord Chesterfield's letters to his son in 18th century England was a well-known English variant. Washington's tutor had simply seized upon one volume in a large stream of guidebooks pouring from European presses. I began to see that the courtesy books, the mansions, and a marked increase in portraiture and decorative fur furnishings marked the coming of a genteel culture to the New World. This system of values and conduct spread from Italy to royal courts throughout Europe. And one by one, the, the courts adopted the new style and finally England at the beginning of the 17th century. Henry VIII, uh, <clears throat> in the 16th century, as depicted by Hans Holbein the Younger, carried power and wealth in his person, reflecting his success as a dominant monarch. But a century later, Charles I, the first of the Renaissance monarchs in England, was depicted by Van Dyck as a person of sophistication and polish. Charles I was the first of the royal connoisseurs who actively collected art and made himself a student of the aesthetic. The peak of splendor was reached, of course, a few years later at Versailles where Louis XIV excelled in controlling the magnates of his kingdom by requiring their presence at court and then overwhelming them with his splendor. The most exquisite and demanding of the courtesy books were for members of the court at Versailles. Of course, of all those, all those who were closest to the king sought to imitate the royal master, not only at court, at, uh, at court, but in their own great houses and in their own persons. Charles I was an exemplar of the genteel style, quite different from his father James I, who was an unspeakably crude person. Naturally, the people closest to the king sought to imitate their royal master, not only in court, but in their own great houses and in their own persons. The English nobility adopted the urbane manners of the courtesy books and constructed and rebuilt the beautiful country, townhouses they needed to exhibit the objects with which they surrounded themselves. This is the first time in English history where people would eat with a fork rather than just a knife and picking up in their fingers. The costs of keeping up to this new standard of gentility were so high that one historian, Lawrence Stone, has speculated and caused a crisis in the aristocracy leading to the English Revolution. They had to pay so much for these houses and their decor that they, they bankrupted themselves. Charles I was executed in 1649, and the spread of refinement was momentarily blocked. But after the Restoration in 1660, it picked up again. This time, refinement spread not only out among the aristocracy, but down the social scale. By the end of the 17th century, the English middle classes were creating modest versions of the great house, houses. Houses like this one in Oxford were growing up in the English countryside just a few decades before similar houses were being constructed in Virginia. Is in the George Withhouse. 
Once here, refinement seemed to affect nearly every aspect of life. This was when I began to get the feeling I had come across a theory of everything, down to seemingly trivial details. As I was contemplating the coming of refinement to the colonies, I ran across the currents in the life of William Byrd II, the owner of many acres and many slaves along the James River in Virginia. Byrd inherited a large estate from his father, the first William Byrd, who occupied the place at the very peak of Virginia society in the late 17th century. And William Byrd II carried on his father's role in Virginia, but made one great change. The first William Byrd lived in a simple frame house I don't have a picture of it, I'm sorry to say, but it was like that but off Williams house I showed you earlier, until his death in 1705. His son occupied the same house until the 1730s, when the growing pressure among the planter class caused him to, to construct one of the most impressive mansions in Virginia, Westover, which still stands and is still occupied. Bird furnished and decorated his house with chairs, porcelains, silver, of the kind that Henry Francis Dupont was later to collect. The second William Byrd exemplified the problem I was trying to solve. Why? A heavy investment in practically useless and very expensive houses and furnishings. An incident in Byrd's diary offered a clue. In the fall of 1711, Governor Alexander Spotswood of Virginia was nearing completion of the governor's palace in Williamsburg. Not enough that they could actually hold functions there in 1711. In connection with the meeting of the governor's council, Byrd, who was a council member, was invited to a dinner and ball to celebrate the queen's birthday. Preparations for the occasion led to a minor tiff between William and his wife, Lucy Park Bird. William briefly noted in his diary that, my wife and I quarreled about her pulling her brows. She threatened she would not go to Williamsburg if she might not pull them. I refused, however, and got the better of her and maintained my authority, at least in the brow plucking department. Apart from our irritation at this outbreak of petty patriarchalism, what is going on here? Why should plucked brows start an argument between William and Lucy? The condition of Lucy's brows did not matter to either of them during their day-to-day -day life on the plantation, but the ball at the Capitol made them uneasy about a tiny detail of appearance as if they were entering another cultural zone with more demanding standards of behavior. An error there, they both apparently believed, would be a cause of embarrassment. Their dispute was a sign that it was essential to get it right for the society assembled at the ball. The longest entry in Bird's diary, it's a very long diary, was his description of the ball the next day. The dangers foreshadowed in the eyebrow tiff were borne out in his extended review of the dance. Speaking of the dancers, he noted that Colonel Smith's son made a sad freak. And then went on to say the president of the council, who should have been attired in a costume keeping with his position, had the worst clothes of anybody there. William and Lucy rightly feared criticism when they were so merciless in dealing it out to themselves. Out themselves, Something important was at stake in dancing gracefully and dressing suitably and having your eyebrows right. When the governor first arrived, Spotswood uh, first got there, he wrote home saying, I think I'm going to find here. There are many excellent dancers in my government. That were a mark of character. Can you say that in the American Antiquarian Society? <laughs> the Virginians attending the governor's ball 
were remote provincials struggling to assemble for a grand occasion. Byrd complimented Governor Spotswood's supper, which was very fine and in good order. Spotswood bought his own chef with him, was going to trust Virginia Cooks. Dallas Byrd's wish was the same for the entire event. It was shameful to dance poorly or dress shabbily because it detracted from the occasion. The awkward dancer and the sloppy dresser let down everyone by failing to rise to the occasion. The struggle over the correct eyebrows reflected the bird's vanity to be sure, but also their yearning to play their proper roles in the creation of an elevated and refined occasion. Eyebrows and clothes combined with dancing, food, conversation, and the appearance of the room to make this assembly all that the participants hoped it would be. They were trying to create a refined society. Anyone who erred was subject to silent rebuke rather than marred the occasion. Society was to be different at the Capitol, more exalted and refined. I begin to suspect that beautiful objects, like beautiful people, were crucial to the gender's effort to achieve their elevated condition. If you look at the Dutch pictures of life in uh, Netherlands, low life taverns, they're doing exactly the same thing that's going on in this picture. They're dancing, eating, flirting, enjoying music. But there's a world of difference, and it's all done by the decor and the manner in which these activities are carried forward. The purchase of beautifully decorated objects then was not the whim of wealth or simple-minded mimicry. Decorative arts meant far more than the provincial desire to imitate the capital. These objects were instruments for achieving a higher mode of living, a way of being polished, refined, and civilized. At the center, of course, was the polished and refined individual, the starting point of all civilization. Refinement was an intense self-discipline that began at an early age and continued through a lifetime. Judging by the courtesy books, there was a rule for virtually every form of personal behavior from management of the body to conversation and training. <coughs> One expert said there was even a rule for how to sleep properly. Take the simple matter of handwriting. In the 17th century, most people wrote in a crabbed and tortured script that is impossible to interpret without special training. Well-educated people made no effort to write elegantly. But along with all else in Gentilini's inventory came a beautiful, flowing Italian hand that ladies and gentlemen began to emulate, and Washington had to learn as part of his training. Writing masters set up shops in colonial cities to instruct young ladies and gentlemen in how to present themselves politely through the appearance of a letter. By the time of the revolution, nearly every signer of the Declaration of Independence, not just John Hancock, wrote in this proper script. Important as personal cultivation was, however, a polished individual was not the culmination of genteel discipline. It must be remembered that genteel conduct originated as a discipline for royal courts. It did not fulfill itself in the satisfactions of personal polish. Lord Chesterfield explained in his letters to his son what the goal was. It was, he said, to shine in the best company. Gentility aimed at the assembling of a polite company, where persons of refinement basked in each other's admiration and where together they could create a harmonious and beautiful group. Their word for it was polite to society. It was to enter into that society, to contribute and not detract, to be worthy of admiration and acceptance that Lucy and William Byrd troubled themselves about the eyebrows. It was the formation of a polite society, moreover, that only gave meaning to houses and their furnishings and hence to the decorative arts. These great houses were really machines for entertainment. The bedrooms are often pushed way up in the attic. The great decorated rooms were 
the rooms where they dined and helped get uh, socials of one for another. Beautiful house interiors were an extension of beautiful people, the necessary and proper environment, environment for a polished life. These powerful impulses, the product of the genteel culture imported from Europe, began to infuse the colonies in the decades leading up to the American Revolution. What was to come of them after the break with England? Gentility would easily have become another casualty of independence. Remember that refinement was anchored in the royal courts and was most properly the possession of the aristocracy. In the colonies, the gentry were the ones to adopt it. It marked their status as those with the right to rule. What was to happen in a nation that repudiated monarchy and aristocracy? In January of 1776, on the eve of independence, John Adams foreshadowed the end of genteel culture in a letter to Mercy Warren, whose portrait we saw earlier. In a facetious tone, he posed a serious question. Pray, madam, are you for an American monarchy or republic? Monarchy is the genteelest and most fashionable government. And I don't know why the ladies ought not to consult elegance and the fashion as well in government as gowns, bureaus, or chariots. For my own part, I am so tasteless as to prefer a republic. A republic will produce strength, heartiness, activity, courage, fortitude, and enterprise. The manly, noble, and sublime qualities in human nature in abundance. A, not a monarchy would produce so much taste and politeness, so much elegance in dress, furniture, equipage, so much music and dancing, so much fencing and skating, so much cards and backgammon, so much horse racing and cockfighting, so many balls and assemblies, so many plays and concerts that the very imagination of them makes me feel vain, light, frivolous, and insignificant. In Adam's view, genteel life was not only uh, was not only out of keeping with the Republic because of its aristocratic associations, but dissonant with the spirit of the Republic, which was hardy, courageous, enterprising, not elegant, vain, and frivolous. With all the state, with all the attacks on aristocracy that came thick and fast after the Revolution, why was gentility not obliterated from American culture? And surely it was not. Houses became larger and more elegant, decorated objects more expensive and elaborate, personal style more sophisticated and polished, both in the great plantation houses in the south and in the merchants' grand townhouses of the north, in the midst of an ongoing democratic revolution in which all things aristocratic were condemned, gentility flourished and indeed spread. Decorative arts in America did not wilt after 1776, they bloomed more luxuriantly than ever. Why should that be, considering their origins and meaning? One answer was that an American gentry needed, and an independent America needed gentility more than ever. With the demise of the inherited aristocracy, gentlemen by blood, there was an increased need for a vocabulary of dignity to mark those who were to rule. No one understood this better than George Washington. Over a lifetime, Washington mastered the arts of genteel composure and presence. And during his presidency, quite self-consciously, deployed, deployed all of this skill to lend dignity to his office. The effect at times was almost magical. An observer in 19, 1794, saw the president walk in stately splendor from his carriage to Independence Hall to address a meeting of Congress. Here's his report. Washington got out of the carriage and slowly crossing the pavement, ascended the steps of the edifice. Upon the utter upper platform of which he paused and turning half around, looked in the direction of a carriage which had followed the lead of his own. Thus he stood for a minute distinctly seen by everybody. He stood in all his civic dignity and moral grandeur, 
erect, serene, majestic. His costume was a full suit of black velvet, his hair in itself blanched by time, powdered to a snowy whiteness, a dress sword in his side, and his hat held in his hand. Thus he stood in silence, and what moments those were. Throughout the dense crowd of profound <coughs> stillness reigned. Not a word was, was heard, not a breath. All were gazing in mute, unutterable admiration, every eye riveted on that form the greatest, the purest, and most exalted of mortals. It might have seemed as if he stood in that position to gratify the assembled thousands with a full view of the father of their country. Not so. It paused for a secretary, then I believe Mr. Dandridge or Colonel Laird, who got out of the other carriage, a chariot decorated like his own, the secretary ascending the steps, handing him a paper, probably a copy of the speech he was delivered, when both entered the building. Then it was, and not until then that the crowds had huzzas, loud, long, earnest, enthusiastic. If the new government deployed gentilities to support its authority, there was, I believe, an even more powerful dynamic at work in its spread after the revolution, democracy. Gentil culture in all of its manifestations did not remain the possession of the gentry after the revolution. The wealthy elite, of course, purchased the finest and most expensive houses and, fur fur and furnishings. But the great transformation after 1776 was that the class below, the great middle class in American terms, middling farmers, well-to-do artisans, clerks, and school teachers, the very people empowered by democracy, laid claim to their own versions of gentility. They installed parlors in simple houses purchased carpets from the floor, drank tea from inexpensive creamware, planted shrubs and grass in front yards where there had been weeds and packed earth. With the aid of eager entrepreneurs, they created a vernacular gentility that was simpler, less expensive, and less pretentious. This merchant of New Milford, Connecticut, ever ancient Polish gentleman, proudly gave his viewers a glimpse of his shop shelves and his account books along with his elegant, stylishly attired body. The spread rather than the demise of gentility reminds us that revolutionary opposition can take two forms. It can, can destroy the culture of the preceding ruling class, or it can appropriate it. In the American Revolution, the choice was appropriation. Democratic society, instead of obliterating genteel culture, held that to the victor belongs the spoils. Ordinary people made gentility their own. The result was that the decorative arts flourished in the 19th century. The vast new demand for beautiful furnishings created a huge market for chairs, tables, ceramics, tableware, and every other form of decorative object. And that need was met by a rapid increase in production, first by improved efficiencies in traditional shops, and eventually by machine production in factories. As much as a much broader public absorbed gentility, the sheer volume of decorative arts exceeded 18th century type production many times over. The objects still held their promise of elevation. My parents called paintings and ceramics and carved furniture the finer things of life. The objects pointed to some superior spiritual realm that respectable people honored and drew upon and ordinary people yearned for. It represented a doorway into a higher way of life. Mothers with any ambition for their children taught them to say please and thank you and to blow their noses in a handkerchief. Gentility became an essential component to virtually any kind of success, more than religious piety and more than book learning or even skill. Without the marks of gentility inscribed in one's being, access to the realm of the polished and powerful was almost invariably denied. The urge to rise created a huge market for every form of genteel nature. It was an essential component of success in a mobile society. Genteel, gentility grew in power and influence throughout the 19th century. How stands refinement now? 
The most frequent question after refinement came out was about the fate of gentility in our day. The question was usually asked in tones of despair. I think virtually everyone who posed the query was doubtful about gentility's prospects in our time. My immediate response was to cheer them up. Gentility, I assured them, was far from dead. It has, I believe, settled as a permanent residue in our culture, and signs of it can be seen ev everywhere. Look at crude college students when they go for an interview with Goldman Sachs. T-shirts, t-shirts disappear, and coats and ties come out of nowhere. Teenagers who really want something their parents know to say please and to show gratitude. Genteel manners are one of the garments in virtually every closet, and most people know how to don good manners when the occasion requires. There are signs of gentility in the commercial world, too. Ralph Lauren, the Bronx-born son of Polish immigrants, has made a fortune peddling merchandise that helps the aspiring to emulate the lifestyle of the English gentry and their American equivalents. In buying his stuff, one emulates the style of the English country house, the heartland of 18th century firemen, and its American equivalent, the prep school. For Lauren, gentility is both an ideal and a commercial resource. If refinement does not govern our culture as it once did, it is still ingrained at some level. I am struck with how infrequently the person standing next to me in the New York subway line Pride, informs my nose that she, he or she has not bathed recently. Our line begins in the Bronx, cuts through Manhattan, burrows under the East River, and ends up in Brooklyn. It gathers into itself a true cross-section of middling and lower-class New York, and virtually all of those people know about bathing. Many of them stand up and offer a seat when my wife and I taught along. If genteel manners are not regnant, they are certainly widely diffused in contemporary American society. Nevertheless, I would agree with the despairing that good manners are not at the cutting edge of social progress as they once were. Professional skills are. They don't have the urgency they once did. There's even a subversive culture anti-gentility a certain kind of a personal authenticity which can be achieved by being crude and offensive, by flaunting extravagant misbehavior rather than seeking for the polished beauty of the genteel paragon. Gentility cannot leave the van now because, it is, because no longer is it anchored in power. Monarchy and aristocracy with a home base of refinement in the 18th century. Both have faded in Western society in the 20th century. They are no longer considered to occupy the pin pinnacle of the desirable life. For a time, the Duke of Windsor led fashion in the 1930s, but he was a rare and somewhat disturbing model. What other aristocrats do we look for for models of behavior? <coughs> Diana, perhaps, and the very middle class, Kate Middleton, but they are personalities and celebrities as much as they are representatives of a ruling class. The powerful people in the United States today, the modern successors of the aristocracy, are the professionals and the celebrities, business executives, politicians, big-time lawyers, leading physicians, and a few academics on the one hand, and sports stars, musicians, and actors on the other. These people are looked for, too, for ways of living, but they are an unsteady guide. They do not live by a distinctive code as the 18th century aristocracy did. The entire, they inspire tennis shoe styles and maybe wristwatches, but not a superior manner. Modern etiquette books lack the authority of the 18th century courtesy books, their predecessors. Celebrities are a little cherry about revealing their personal lives. They set fashions, perhaps, but not, do not set a standard mothers want their girls and boys to emulate. Cultural power is diffused.
fused in the democratic 20th century rather than focused as it was in the aristocratic 18th century. Powerful people did not lead culturally. Rich men and women are as likely to wear cowboy jeans as the poor are to aspire to own fur coats. Instead of relying on the social order hierarchy to incul inculcate civility, today it falls to lesser units to teach good manners and polite behavior. Families and churches, schools and companies, local societies. We certainly cannot depend on Congress to show us the way. <laughs> its abilities to flourish in our day, like so much else in our modern world, will have to rise from the grassroots, from ordinary people like you and me. Thank you.